but we'll concentrate on uh, the giant figures who brought about the scientific revolution and who quantified and uh, mechanized the worldview, which is the most significant thing. Uh, this process of the scientific revolution, which took place uh, as a result of several factors coming together from about 1600 until about 1700, during the century, 17th century. Uh, you can read about, and there are excellent books on it, including the book of I. Bernard Cohen, the book of Dixter Hoyce, probably the best book, the book of the wonderful books of Alexandre Coiret, the Russian emigre uh, to France, who is, I think, the most brilliant of all scholars dealing with this subject. He has a book, has a book on Galileo, he has a book, three-volume work called Etude Galilienne, Galilean Studies, three-volume work, Etude Newtonienne, on Newton, Newton and uh, all of these other different figures. It's vast, vast literature. And, uh, of course, for this course, I just hope the graduate students at least will spend one afternoon in the library to go and look at these books to see what they look like physically, so at least you, you know of their existence, and perhaps later on refer to them. Uh, this whole process is sometimes called, uh, as in the famous book of Dixter Hoyce, the mechanization of the worldview. What took place was a quantification and mechanization of Western man's view of the cosmos. Everything else must be seen in the light of this. Now, many factors went into this, how this was done. First of all, when you say mechanization, that means a living view of the cosmos, it changed into a dead one. And we have very important process, uh, steps, intermediate steps, in which the universe, uh, starting with the Earth itself, where we are, was uh, seen at first, at the beginning of the scientific revolution, as still a living being. Like this, uh, for example, the Stoic saw it, like Plato saw it, and Timaeus. And uh, Kepler's famous book, early book, was called The Harmony of the World, which it were, uh, refers to the world as a living being. Now, this gradually uh, leaves the scene, that is, life is taken out of the world, and the world is changed the model of a clock. And so you have a very profound transformation, which is still very much with us. Uh, the mentality of modern civilization is deeply dominated by the mechanistic worldview of the 17th century. Yeah. Medicine, uh, although it should know better, still tries to consider the body as a big factory, as a machine. Our arms and legs are seen as levers and so forth and so on. And you always get these pictures of uh, molecules and atoms as billiard balls banging against each other. Were totally absurd, but the image that is created is very, very strong uh, to the extent we always try to reduce the living to the dead, if I can call it this way. And this is the period in which modern science tries to reduce the, what I call the living to the dead. That is, to, uh, to reduce things to the model of a clock and try to change the idea of life to that of force. Newton, in some of his correspondences, is exchanging with other people, uh, Clark, others, uh, talks about this, and they criticize Newton and said, use of force is still some kind of a magical life force and so forth. How, why do you use this? He says, uh, there's no other choice. So, I mean, there is, there is such a thing as force. But, of course, in our mentality, we say force. Oh, that's uh, innocuous. That's fine. But if you say an angel, that's very dangerous. But what is force? We don't know what force is. They don't have the foggiest idea of modern science what forces. But uh, it was a way of, in a sense, reducing this incredible world of creation around us to the model of a clock. I can hardly overemphasize for you this. And in fact, I want to say a few words about this before we come to the great philosophers and thinkers who provided intellectual uh, prop for modern scientific revolution. Something else was going on in Europe during the Renaissance that we cannot overlook. And this has been especially brought out by Marxist historians of science, by, and by Marxism, who sees, of course, all history as product of economic forces. And do not think that when you say Marxist historians, it means always somebody sitting with a hat like money in the Kremlin. Uh, it, uh, half of American historians of, uh, of one kind or another are really dominated by Marxism. 
all those who try to reduce all history to economic uh, factors and which the, who think economic factors are primary are influenced by Marxism. Because it was he, Marx, who for the first time made this analysis in this way. If, once you understand it this way, you see how influential it still is in America. Which, for example, the living habits of people in New York are analyzed according to their economic have, uh, life. It has been done by a thousand times. That's the main Marxist thesis. Now, Marxist historians came along, and they wanted to show, of course, that the scientific revolution, which they consider to be one of the great periods of human history, because it moved man towards a great appreciation of what they thought was an appreciation of materialism, of dialectical materialism, was a very important step. Uh, they interpreted the economic factors involved, and since then, a lot of Western historians have also written about this. Now, it's all, de definitely have some significance. I'm not denying it. Otherwise, I would not be speaking about it. But I do not believe that you can explain, uh, let's say, someone like Einstein by the how much his mother made uh, or father made when he was living in Austria and, uh, and that kind of thing. But, uh, I think that ideas predominate in science, but also the economic aspects are important. And in this case especially, although science and technology is very important in the West, did not become wet together until the 19th century. The two different traditions moving along. There are a few things. I mean, the lens was made in Holland so that Galileo could look at the moons of Jupiter, and that brought about modern astronomy. I'm not saying there was no relationship, but I, I, the situation that we have today, in which you have developed physics, or developed biology, next week there's a conference on how to apply this, and how to make money out of it, that's the bottom line. And, uh, and therefore, technology is very closely related to pure science. This is a much more recent phenomenon. In the 17th century, 16th century, this was not the case. But there, is, there are certain facts which are very important. And one is that from the end of the Middle Ages, there develops in Europe for the first time a mercantile society. It's, it's, we've seen already towards the end of the Middle Ages. And especially in Italy. It's not accidental that the Renaissance begins in Italy and not in Sweden or Germany. It was there this mercantile class was the strongest. A class that was interested in things, in material things, in objects, and uh, was much more independent of the theological structure of the church and in the context of Christian civilization was always downgraded. In Islam, the mercantile society was very easily integrated. Uh, the bazaar is the center of piety. But in medieval Europe, uh, the people who did business was considered to be below the dignity of people. And that is why you had blue laws in America until a few years ago, and you still have them in England. That's why you couldn't uh, open up uh, big shops on Sunday until Kmart came along and changed that. Uh, but uh, the mall, all the malls. But that's a very recent problem. the final death of the Christian view of the calendar. That's what it is. But in the old days, uh, the, the mercantile class was not looked upon with favor. And so it provided also an ambience for secular thought, you might say, for, the, for secularization of things, including of the world. It's a factor definitely to consider in the rise of the scientific revolution, which is deal with the secularization of the cosmos, if nothing else. There's a second factor which is important, and that is that European technology, which until the 13th century was much less uh, developed, quotes and quotes, I hate this word, but I use it nevertheless, than let's say Islam or China, those two other great civilizations which had very elaborate technology, from the 14th century on began to ascend that is making more uh, efficient pulleys, carts, wheels, objects, uh, you name it. And much of it with knowledge that came from the Islamic world, like uh, steel making, making of swords, and so forth. And much of it, uh, some of it from China, like making of paper, which came through the Islamic world, or making of gunpowder, which came independent of the Islamic world. And that one, one invention taken from China was able to then dominate China for the next 500 years and the rest of, of Asia. It was a very, very important technological invention. But uh, the European technology was very much on the rise. And uh, Muslims couldn't understand why the Europeans were so much interested in these things. But Europeans were much more interested in the te Islamic technology than Islamic civilization itself was, which kept it at a particular place. It did not emphasize the past a certain amount. It's interesting that, for example, uh, the great explorers in the West, including both uh, uh, Columbus and Magellan and Henry the Navigator, all of them had Muslim 
navigators using Islamic uh, te- instruments for navigation using technology. But by, by the 15th century, the West is, is already the most powerful technological civilization in the world in a certain sense. Even by the 15th century, I would say, if you take everything together, it, it becomes, it develops a technological prowess, which other civilizations did not develop because they were not interested in it. They did not, they did not want to invest more than a certain amount of their energy in this domain. But a lot more energy was spent in this domain in the West, so by the time we get to the 16th century, they have a fairly elaborate technology, which from the point of the scientific revolution is very important, especially in one field, and that is the development of clocks. Uh, that is the idea of a mechanical model. Now, uh, I, do not, I do not have time to go into the history of clock making. Uh, already, uh, the Muslims had developed very, very elaborate water clocks and things like that, in which water would flow and would something, the ball would jump up and a cuckoo would come out, and this kind of thing you've seen in pictures. Uh, and this was presented to the West also as gifts, but developed in, Westerners began to develop this more and more elaborately to the extent that any city in Europe in the Renaissance would take great honor and pride in having one of these mechanical clocks that you still have medieval European cities to go today. At 12 o'clock, you know, a door opens up and two little uh, statues come out and bang on, a, on the bell. And, you know, this, I'm sure you've seen these things. But it penetrated into the consciousness of Europeans in a way that you did not have the Islamic world where the caliph or a few other people might have seen these things, or in India or in China. If you're living in a, a Chinese, remarkable machines that the Chinese developed, but it was not part of the consciousness of the people. So the idea of the clock universe which the 17th century revolution proposed. Many people think it was very significant that it spoke to people. But people, everybody saw these mechanical clocks. The idea that the universe is like a big clock, that God has created a wound up, but now has nothing to do with it. Which therefore pushes God out of the universe, in the deistic position also. This is very significant in the confrontation between Christian Christianity and modern science. But the Christian God is not simply the God of deism. Even if, when Christianity was weakened, no Christian could accept that God's hand were completely cut off from his creation. That the Abrahamic world would not accept such a view of God. And so the mechanical clock also strengthened the idea of the deistic view of God. Uh, I hope all of you understand what this is. That we have two terms in English, both of which mean the same thing, really, uh, etymologically, but have developed different meanings. I hope everybody in this class knows the difference between these two. For historians of religion and theologians, when you say deism or philosophers, it means a worldview, a philosophy, a theology, whatever you like to call it, in which you accept the existence of God, but a God who is limited to the creation of the world. It has nothing to do with the running of the world. You cannot participate in the everyday affairs of the world. This is called deism. Theism is opposite to that. It means to believe in a God who not only has created the world, but maintains and sustains it and acts actively in the world. Now, of course, these are not the only two. You have then atheism, non-theism, and all kinds of other schools. But uh, these two, because they're so much alike, and they're both the same word. The word deus and theos both mean God. So etymologically, they should mean the same thing, but they do not mean the same thing. I do not want you ever to make a mistake between deism and theism. Major battles went on in the 17th century and the 18th century between the scientific view of the world, which at that time was scientific deism, not agnosticism that developed in the 20th century among many scientists. Most scientists, almost all of them, some of them are very pious, they were theists, including Newton. But even those who were not pious, they were not usually atheists or agnostic, they were deists on one side and then the theists on the other side. And even within Christianity, they developed certain churches like the Universalist Church in Boston, which claimed to be both Christian and deistic, and which was very pro-rationalism and modern science and uh, this kind of humanistic and so forth. So uh, you also had humanistic deism in between, which did not identify itself with Christianity, but was not also atheistic humanism. It's called humanistic deism. So these terms are crucial for the understanding 
of uh, the scientific revolution, its impact upon religion in the West. And this mechanical view, which I'm mentioning for you now, the idea that of the clock model is from where the idea is and really sunk into the minds of people. Of course, a great philosopher can think of deism without a model. But the idea that deism spread among the population, people would understand what deism is, but they always refer to the, mo the model of the clock, the mechanical clock. Now, the mechanical clock alone, of course, did not create the mechanistic view of the universe, but it provided a very good model, a very good of, of letting people think about the, what the world is like. The scientific revolution specified for the next two and a half centuries, three centuries practically, let's say from 1600 to 1900, the task of all science to be to study and to make known how this clock works. Its movements, pressures, forces, components, weight, and so forth and so on. He was not interested in the being of the clock. The category of existence or being was no longer the subject of modern science. But it was with quantity, with a mathematization, quantification, and we're seeing how the clock worked. When you have the clock model, or any mechanical model, you're interested in seeing how it works, not why. And so the whole category of why came out of modern science also. In physics class, we never ask the question, why does the hydrogen atom, uh, let's say, have only uh, one proton? That's a meaningless question. You cannot ask why. You only ask how. And the whys you ask are always related to the how. I mean, you say, well, why is the tree wet because it rained? I mean, I mean that, the why it always stops there. But the philosophical why, the metaphysical why, which in fact religion always asks the why of things, would be excluded from this model, which was not interested to see why the universe was what it was, but how it worked how it worked. Yes? Uh, what, no, give me the model of what? To ask why? Yes, it is. Yes, it is possible. Theoretically, it's possible. But it's no longer an interesting question. You might say, for those who are interested in seeing how the clock works. And so those who asked this question were taken out of the context of being serious scientists, step by step. There were still some people who asked this question. But they either asked it as theologians or philosophers or as individuals, but when they put on their dress as a scientist, they were not supposed to ask this question, especially in the field of physics. I mean, medicine is somewhat different, but in the field of physics, which was the, really the motor for this whole uh, uh, revolution, that the scientific revolution came through the field of astronomy and physics, mathematical astronomy and physics. Everything else followed, chemistry, all of these things followed suit, even biology. Now, uh, to do this, as I said, the mechanical model is not enough. You have to reduce the status of the cosmos. Even if you don't want to use the word reduce, you have to make the status of the cosmos such as to be able to treat it mathematically and with pure mathematics and nothing else. That is, you have to be able to quantify the cosmos. You have to say that uh, the cosmos, what is significant in the cosmos, is what can be quantified. And this was achieved by Descartes and Galileo. The most important contribution of Descartes and Galileo, and especially Galileo, beyond all of his important astronomical discoveries, the, uh, the law of projectile motion, and so forth and so on, the law of inertia, was this question, the basic, basic question of what he called the primary qualities and the secondary qualities. This is the first thing we have to learn. Uh, Galileo claimed that in the world of nature, in the cosmos, there are two types of qualities. And he's using the word quality here uh, in parentheses, or, uh, because it means quality and quantity. Primary quality is that quality which is measurable mathematically and therefore quantifiable. Secondary quality is that which is not measurable 
and which in fact is irrelevant and unreal. For example, uh, if you have a red apple, the weight of the apple, the size of the apple, the curvature of the uh, circle around the apple, those are primary qualities which are quantifiable. But the color red is in fact not quantifiable, it's secondary quality and it's irrelevant to the study of science. And so but with one stroke, Galileo takes out the whole of qual quality out of the cosmos. This quality is derivative and important, and what is important is quantity. Now Descartes does that in another way, in a much more radical philosophical way, because Descartes is a much more important philosopher than Galileo, and that is by reducing reality to the two poles of the knowing subject and the extensa or the known object, which is only pure quantity. And it's with this that I'll, I'll continue my discussion on Thursday, because that's one of the crucial, most crucial points in the history of Western thought.